This is a short but epic tale about a lump of bearing bronze. It was probably cast in the late 1800s, perhaps in a foundry in the West Midlands of England. We know little about its subsequent history until it somehow came into the possession of a machinist at Ruston and Hornsby in Lincoln in the 1920s. He'd used it as a soft anvil for knocking dowel pins into steel fixtures. In the early 1950s, as he came up to retirement, he gave a box of tools and assorted bits and bobs to my father, who was a young turret lathe operator at the time, working on the production of parts for large diesel engines. Later, when the space age technology of gas turbines came along, my father made parts for those and then trained as a precision tool and cutter grinder. He kept that lump of bronze in his toolbox, using it as a soft anvil for, well, knocking dolphins into fixtures. Some things don't change much. When he died, I found that lump of bronze in one of his toolboxes and kept it handy, but I've got a press for dolphins, so it sat sadly in the dank depths of an old red wooden toolbox. One day, I was asked to make an elevation pivot plate for a 432 MHz moon bounce antenna system consisting of four very long Yagis with GRP supporting booms. It was driven by a large satellite dish actuator and needed to be very sturdy to survive high winds as an exposed site in the Netherlands. I needed something to make split bushes to support the main pivot axle. I was considering ultra high molecular weight polyethylene, but then that lump of bronze with its long history came to mind. It seemed like a noble task for such a venerable slab of copper tin alloy. So I retrieved it from the old box. It was a bit green with verdigris, but I chopped it up with a bandsaw, drilled and reamed a centre hole, turned a mandrel with an M6 tapped hole to clamp it in place for turning, and set about machining the outside diameter to fit the bored holes in the bearing carriers. Once it was turned to size and faced, I made three more bushes from the rest of the bronze, keeping just a small piece as a memento. I heated the bearing carriers and pressed in the bushes, leaving a 2mm annular gap in the centre as a grease reservoir. For safety's sake, I drilled and tapped transverse holes for grub screws to lock the bushes in place so they didn't blow out under pressure. Ask me how I know that that could happen without the grub screws. Yes, bad times. Now, I just had to centre the bushes on the mill, drill the bore out to 19mm, then using a boring bar, finish the bore to a 0.02mm running fit on the 20mm axle. Meanwhile, I machined up the knuckle that holds the axle pin from a large piece of 150 by 100 mm aluminium billet. And fitted the axle with M8 grub screws fitting into spot drilled recesses to prevent rotation or side movement of the axle. A smear of grease and the bearing slid nicely onto the axle with just the right amount of silky smooth resistance. Once the rest of the parts were completed and fitted to the 10mm plate, the elevation pivot assembly found its way across the North Sea and was bolted to the top of a large mast along with the four long yuggies and associated preamps and cabling. From the look of spots on the DX cluster, I think it's working very nicely. Japan and Israel on 432 MHz is impressive. That lump of metal, born in a fiery crucible in Victorian England, is now doing sterling service for an expatriate Yorkshireman in the Netherlands, bringing a bit of joy into the hearts of 432 MHz moon bounce operators all over the world. I hope it feels it's met its destiny as a bearing after perhaps 130 years of patient dreaming from the bottom of at least three machinists' toolboxes.